you can have a seat. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online, uh, those of us who are in the room. My name's Mike. I actually am one of the pastors here. I realize I've been gone for a few weeks, and some of you are like, who's this guy? And uh, yeah, I'm back, and I've missed you all. Uh, it's good to see you. I've been joining you online, and so I want to especially give a shout out to everybody joining online. Um, but I missed you, and, and kind of wrote a a ditty. I am back. You came to see. I remember how much you love me. Coronavirus rives, the blues fall. We see each other through it all. Da 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 See, I love this room. Number one, you can tell the Hamilton fans. And then you can tell the people who are like, what in the world is going on? There's this like well-known musical, Hamilton, came out on Disney+, Plus, kind of addictive. Um, so, no, <laughs> it went better here, though, than last service. People like looked at me like, what? Um, no, but it is good to be back, and it's good to be back in this conversation uh, that we started a couple weeks ago. Pastor Jennifer started. The, uh, the sermon series we're in is called Asking for a Friend, and we use this phrase sometimes because uh, we have a question that's a little bit too uncomfortable or difficult, or, or we just don't feel like I can ask it, but so I like Asking for a friend, maybe my imaginary friend. Um, sometimes we really do have a friend that we're asking for. But, but we've been talking about some questions that maybe some of you are wrestling with. And uh, I went and planned our sermon series out, and I had a topic for this week. Um, but during my time away, a different topic came to mind. One that was very personal to me, and I'm guessing, I'm hoping some of you, or, or maybe some of your friends uh, have wrestled with this question. Um, here it is. What do I do if I'm blah? And you can fill in that blah with whatever adjective. Uh, you know, what do I do if I'm empty or frustrated or exhausted or depressed or feeling distance from God or, or, or just blah? Any of you feel that way? Especially with the coronavirus going on? I know I have felt this way. I needed some time because I, I was wrestling with that question. And I have friends, almost every one of my friends I talk with um, are wrestling at different points, maybe now, maybe in the past, are wrestling with that question. And in fact, I was talking to one of my friends who I think is joining us online. Uh, she got possibly exposed, and so she was talking about how that made her feel to be exposed to the coronavirus and, and just all the feelings and the blah. And um, so I want to look at that. I want to ask, like, what do we do about it? Does the Bible have anything to say? Shocking, yes. Actually, it does. I know you're like, really? The Bible has something to say about it in church? Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I went looking for some of those questions, and it doesn't talk specifically about the coronavirus, obviously, but it does give us some wisdom, some guidance about how to lead our lives even during difficult times. How to live faithfully even when we think things or experience things chaotic in our world. And so I want to talk about some things that I needed to hear. Maybe some of you need to hear this. And um, here's four lessons. And the first one's real. By the way, nor we have our program for our church online on the church app. You can download the First UMC app through the Google or Apple Store, and you can follow along, except trying to get back in the rhythm. I realized I didn't put the sermon notes in the app this week. I will later because there's some scriptures that you may want, but uh, just jot paper and text yourself or something. Uh, but four lessons that we're going to talk about today, and here's the first one, real simply. Rest. In the Bible, we call this word um, Sabbath. And one of the weird things for me, and probably some of you during the coronavirus, is um, that I've been working from home a lot more. And what that means is it's really hard to identify, like, work time from non-work time. I mean, there's benefits to, like, working from home, right? Like the dress code, epic. Uh, snack time, 
lit, as you can tell. Um, the problem, though, is like, how do you separate? Like, when am I working? When do I not? Because there's always more to do. And most of us have bought into a lie in our world, and that is we think rest is something that we do when our work is finished. And so you work all day. And whether you're working at home, working away from home, you work all day, you get done, and what do you do? You go home and do laundry, right? And then after laundry, what do you do? Well, you go mow the yard. And then after you mow the yard, what do you do? Well, then you make dinner. And then what do you do? You clean up dinner. And then you have to pick up the house. And then you check some emails. And it brings you back into just doing a few more work things. And you're working and working. All of a sudden, you're like, I'm exhausted. So what do you do? You collapse in bed. Right? Anybody find this rhythm? And then what do we think of that collapsing in bed? That's our rest time. And we do that. We do that Day after day after day after day after day. Some of us have lost the concept of days. Some of us come to church just to know what day, at least one day a week, what day it is, right? Oh, it's Sunday today. I know this one. But, but we've kind of blurred the line. So, so what do we do? And the part of the problem is many of us fall into the lie that work is what's important and rest is optional. Rest is bonus. And we say this, right? We say this in different ways. Um, I have to do this now. I can rest when? Later. Or dead. Yeah, that's another one we say, is I'll rest when I'm dead. By the way, you know who says that? People who have heart attacks, (laughs) right? They do. Trust me, I've heard it. You know, we we say, uh, I can't afford to rest. I have too much to do. A rest later. It does later ever come? Well, there's a different rhythm that God teaches us. It's actually, I'm going to read it one place. It's repeated throughout the scriptures, but I'm going to read from Exodus 20, starting in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day and treat it as holy. That word holy means sacred, means special. In other words, it doesn't mean optional. It doesn't mean ordinary. It doesn't mean meaningless. It means This is something important. This is a gift. It's holy. He says, six days you may work and do everything, all your tasks. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Don't. I love that. I think sometimes the verse should have just ended there. Don't. What about, no, don't. Well, you don't under, don't. And then he goes on. Don't do any work on it. Not you. Not your sons or daughters, not your male or female servants, not your animals. Isn't it funny that animals made the list? Um, Nor the immigrants who are working with you. Because the Lord made heavens and earth, the sea, and everything in it in six days, but he rested on the seventh day. That's why the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy, made it special. Do you know where this passage is from? This passage is from... The Ten Commandments, God's first instructions to the Jewish people. And specifically, this is commandment number four, which means God said, take one day every week to rest. That is, he got, he said that before he said, don't lie, don't cheat, and don't murder. Like before he gets to like, don't kill people, he says, you need to know that rest is important because he wants that to be a priority. And it's a priority because God knows that if we don't do this, we're going to end up what? Blah. Tired, exhausted, frustrated, empty, far from God. Now here's my struggle, and I don't know if any of you struggle with this, but especially during the coronavirus, especially during times of chaos, I know I need some rest, right? We get that. I know. I knew in June I needed rest. Guess who else knew, by the way? My wife knew I needed rest. She told me. Guess who else knew, by the way? The staff here at First Church, like Pastor Mike, you need a vacation. You need some rest. I have a feeling I wasn't the most loving pastor for a little bit. I'm glad I didn't get an amen, although I got a few chuckles. Some of you knew it. Some of you told me it. The the problem is, the things that I normally did that I needed to do, I couldn't do, right? I normally, I rest. I I go to a cards game. Couldn't do that. 
Although they did win two yesterday, they're back. Woohoo! Still can't go. Um, blues game? No. Concerts? Not a beach? Eh -eh. Um, these big cities hanging out? No, 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 no. And you know what I did? I did what most of us have done. I was angry, and I was frustrated, and I was resentful, and I told God all about it. By the way, do you know what that is to tell God about all those feelings? That's prayer. Prayer is a conversation with God. And so God heard me, my heavenly father heard me like a six-year-old just kind of complaining or, or whatever age. And, just, rah, 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 rah. and the beautiful thing about God is God just listened. He just listened. And then whenever I got done, I said, are you done? Yeah. And then I heard God whisper. A couple things that I needed to hear, and maybe some of you need to hear. The, the second lesson that God whispered was that I needed to retreat. I needed to disconnect. And, and sometimes I think we assume that in order to rest, we need to get away. We need to go to a beach. We need to go to a game. We need to go to a spa. We need to get away. But wh what God whispered is retreat is less about a place and more about our posture. And here's what I mean by that. The, literally, the word rest, uh, retreat means to take a step back. And the part of the problem is that some of us can change our location without changing our attention. How many of us work even when we don't work? And we, we work. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. This little thing, right? I want to just point out the irony. I brought my cell phone up here to preach. Think about that. Like, what am I going to do with my cell phone except use it as a prop? Like, am I going to call mom in the middle of, like, preaching? Hi, mom. Call my wife. She's worshiping online today. Um, no. I mean, like, I can't get away from it. And what I learned is, you know, even if I take a day off, Man, I'm glued to it. I'm checking my work emails. I'm checking my uh, Twitter and Facebook and TikToks and all this stuff, right? We, we, we just mindlessly surf it. And what God said is, if you want to rest, you need to disconnect. You need to retreat. You need to take a step back. And so I literally deleted my uh, social media. I deleted my work email apps. And I had to go to my computer. And I didn't do it for like every several days. And I'd just do it for a little bit. Because I knew my heart, my blahness needed to retreat, to take a step back, to take breathing room in my life. I wonder how many of us, I mean our friends, like, not us, I mean, like, asking for a friend. I wonder how many of our friends are empty inside because they're not taking real time to disconnect and retreat and rest in God's presence. Um, by the way, one of the things I also spent time doing, and I'll go to this next, is reading scriptures. I was, you've, if you read through Jesus' life and ministry, you'll notice how many times Jesus retreats. And by the way, he doesn't go very far. He usually like just goes up a hill, just goes in, you know, just a little ways off, it says. He goes just a little ways off to pray, to stop, to listen, to, to retreat. He physically takes a step back, but more importantly, he disconnects. He emotionally takes a step back to rest. And if Jesus, with all that Jesus had to do is rest, think some of us need that lesson, need to learn that rhythm, right? Here's the third thing, and it brought, the other thing Jesus did when he rested, when he retreated, was he reflect. And, and one of the things that was true for me, and maybe some of you, is whenever I knew I needed to rest and retreat, but I couldn't do what I wanted to do, and the, normally the things that I knew to do, I didn't do, so what do I do, right? You get all that? You know, like, that's the literal conversation I had, you know, spiraling down. What do I do? And so I knew I couldn't, I had to fill my time with something. So I rode my motorcycle. <laughs> and I kayaked. And I walked. And I just retreated. One of the things I did is I read non-work books. I 
got a book, New York Times bestseller, about the science of breathing. I'm not that interested in science of breathing, but it, it was something to free margin in my brain from thinking about, you all, I love you, but I need a little break. Um, I read a book about the history of uh, our, the last lecture of Viktor Frankl, who lived through a Nazi internment camp, uh, kind of developed psychotherapy uh, about that, and that was fascinating. I read a, I'm read. i reading a book, I haven't got finished with it yet, about J.P. Morgan and Teddy Roosevelt, about democracy and capitalism and the history there. I'm not much of a history person. What I knew I needed is something to, to remove my brain from thinking about the things that I'm doing. In other words, I needed to create margin in my life. I needed to reflect on different things. I needed to create room in my heart to hear God's voice in a different way. Not only did I read those things, I read scripture not to write a sermon. The irony is whenever you read scripture to not write a sermon, sometimes it actually becomes a part of your sermon, case in point. One of the things I read was from Lamentations 3, and I just think some of you maybe need to hear this scripture. Lamentations 3, 17. I love how this starts. I rejected peace. <laughs> How many of you have rejected peace? There's peace out there. God wants us to have peace. And yet instead of embracing, instead of doing it, you know, peace, rest, reflect, renew. Um, instead, we just stay in the chaos. We get obsessed with more news, with more social media, with more stuff, we, more screens, more noise, more things, more. He said, I rejected, I rejected peace. I've forgotten what is good. <laughs> How many of us forgot what is good? I thought, my future is gone as well as my hope from the Lord. Man, talk about depressing, right? Don't give up yet, but my memory of my suffering. How many of us are just thinking about our suffering? Hope, homelessness. Mm, I know people that are stress, struggling and wrestling with that. Is bitterness and poison. I can't help. But remember, I can't help to think about it. That, that's on the forefront of his mind. I can't help but remember. And I'm blah. And I bring all this to mind. By the way, this is the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is thinking about this, reflecting on this. I bring all, I'm thinking about all this stuff. All this stuff that's making me blah. And here's what he says next. And therefore, I'm going to what? Read it out loud. Online. Come on, I want to hear you. Wait, our favorite word, right? And I love this. This gets far more annoying than you ever know. The word wait here is not simply to wait, but to patiently trust or patiently have faith. And so what he's saying is, even in the middle of blah, what does he do? He says, I'm going to patiently sit knowing that it's not the end of my story, knowing that there's something next. I want to patiently wait. And here's what he says. Certainly, he's waited. Certainly the faithful love of the Lord hasn't ended. You hear it? Like he's exhausted. And all of a sudden it's breath. <sighs> Certainly God's compassion isn't through. God's not done. You hear it? He's like on the ropes. He's about to throw in the towel. And then he waits and he says, God's compassion isn't, isn't through. They are renewed every morning. Sunday's coming. Great is your faithfulness. Man, you could write a song about that verse, right? Great is your faithfulness. Ah. Oh. I started thinking about Jeremiah writing those verses, and then brought to mind the, the Christians, my brothers and sisters, who I don't even know about other parts of the world, our, our partners in, in Dominican Republic, our sister church in Mukukane, Mozambique, people in, in every continent who are Jesus followers, and they're not only regular, wrestling with some of the same things we are with the coronavirus, but things we couldn't even possibly imagine. And I thought it was to be like that. And I started thinking about what Jeremiah said. Even during difficult and frustrating times, we are called to wait. 
to trust, to lean into what God's going to do next. I love it. I started thinking about the prophet Jeremiah when he was in his, one of his most, uh, the prophet Elijah, excuse me, whenever he was in a, one of his most desperate moments of his life, God took him to a mountain, to a cave, to wait. And God, all these things happened, storms and winds and earthquakes, everything else. But finally he got still and silent enough to hear God's still, small voice. I wonder if some of us are blah because we never take time to get quiet enough and still enough to hear God whisper. Part of the rhythm of rest, of, of retreating, uh, of, uh, what's the third R? I just forgot. Of, uh, see if you're paying attention. Reflect. Thank you. Somebody's paying attention for me. And part of that is, is to create space to hear God's voice. Here's a fourth lesson I heard. And this was the most surprising, partially because God doesn't understand the preacher's need for alliteration. Um, that's all ours, rest, uh, retreat, reflect, and then contentment. That uh, doesn't fit. But, and this was a surprising word for me, partially because I didn't realize the extent of my discontentment that was creating my blahness. And some of you don't realize the, the extent of your discontent that is contributing to your blahness. And part of it comes from whenever I see all my friends. And I say that phrase ironically because we use that phrase, all my friends. Well, it's not really all your friends. It's like two people on social media. But that's, we see that. We Button it to everybody. All my friends are going to the beach. What does that do to you? What does that do to me? It creates what? Discontentment. All my friends. And I realized that whenever I start thinking about all the things that I used to be able to do and I can't do right now, like going to a cards game, going to a blues game, going to a concert, what happens in my heart is discontentment. And I didn't realize the discontentment going on. And it was already, fo it was primarily focused on what I didn't have, what I couldn't do, and all the things that were messed up by this dumb coronavirus, right? Anybody feeling that? And what is, it's poisoning us inside. And what I realized is I was looking for the next thing, the next trip, the next event to fix what was fundamentally a spiritual problem, fundamentally a heart problem. What I was looking for something out there to fix what was going on in here. And so I started reading and reflecting on this word contentment. And one of the scriptures that came to mind was Philippians 4. Some of you have heard it before, some of you haven't, but if you've heard it before, hear it with new word, new ears today. Now, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. I'm not saying this because I need anything. Like, how many of us can say that? Like, we, I need stuff, right? Paul's like, I'm not saying this because I need anything. For I've learned how to be content. By the way, this didn't happen. This didn't magically appear. He had to learn how to be content in any situation. Does that include coronavirus? Mm-hmm. I know how the experience of being in need, and I know what it's like to have more than enough. I've learned, listen, shh, shh. I've learned the secret. Shh, don't tell. Okay, you can tell, but it's a secret. But we want everybody to know. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. Whether full or hungry, whether having plenty or being poor, I can endure all these things. What is it that you're struggling with now? You can endure it. You want to know the secret to enduring it? Here it is. The power of the one who gives me strength. Wait, wait, wait. I thought the secret was going to the beach. No, 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 no. Guess what the secret is? Anybody know? Jesus! Like 90% of all the questions I ask. Jesus is the answer. It's, it's God's spirit. Well, I thought it was a boat. No. I thought it was a motorcycle. Helps, but no. I, I thought it was a trip. I thought it was a game. I thought, no. It's Jesus. And we look to all these things, and it creates this emptiness that only Christ fills. And we wonder why we're blah, because we're living 
a lie or we're trying to live a lie. And God wants something different from us. One more scripture. This is just real short. It comes, it's kind of a little tiny tucked away nugget. In the middle of Matthew 7, Jesus says this. He says, hey, you followers, go in through the narrow gate. I'm like, what? What is he talking about? He says, go in through the narrow gate. Now, here's the thing. The gate that leads to destruction is broad and the road is wide. So many people are going to go through it. But there's like this nook. There's this like small back alley place. There's like a tucked away path. You have to know the secret. Paul tells us about the secret, right? It's like this tucked away place. And, and the gate that leads to life is narrow and the road is difficult. So few people find it. And I started thinking about that passage because sometimes we have read that and think it's about heaven and hell or what happens after we die. I don't think that's what Christ is talking about. Or I don't think that's the only thing Jesus is talking about. I think what he's talking about is that there's a path that everybody's doing. And we tell our kids, like, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean you are. Guess what? We never outgrow it. We just don't have people who would tell us, don't do that, right? We stop listening. But the truth is, Jesus says, there's a path that everybody's going to do, and that path is going to lead to destruction. It's a path of more. More work, more stuff, more things, more. It's a path of discontentment. It's a path of working seven days a week and not getting any rest except when you sleep, and even that's marginal. It's a path of never disconnecting, of staying continually online. It's a path that everybody else is doing, and I do mean everybody Jesus says it, and it's a lie. And Jesus says, if you want to experience the life I came for, I'm going to show you a better way. And I, I think some of us are realizing that we're in a spiritual blindness. I meant, I'm sorry, our friends are in a spiritual blindness because we're trying to live a life that we were never created for. And God wants something better for you. So I want to pray. And, and I want you to hear this. If I'm praying for you, I'm praying for a friend, wherever you are. I want you to pray and to think about what does it mean to live in this rhythm of work but rest. Rest in a way that retreats and disconnects. Rest in a way that allows us to reflect. Rest in a way that allows us to be content with where we are right now, regardless of our circumstances. Do you believe what Paul said? Do you believe in what Jesus says? That you can be content even in the middle of the coronavirus. Do you believe it? Are you experiencing it? If not, then maybe we need to lean into a little bit more of what Jesus says. Amen? Let me pray for us. God, Thank you for these profound words that are so uncomfortable. And God, thank you for your love that never ends. Thank you for being with us. God, there's some of us here that are hungry and searching for this. And we don't see a way out. And yet, God, we need a miracle. So we ask that you would work a miracle. Give us the courage to find a different rhythm that honors you. That honors the way you created us. God, for some of us that are maybe here worshiping online, worshiping in the house, maybe some of us, it's that we've never really said, God, I'm going to go all in and trusting you. Come into my life. And some of us are empty because we've never asked you in. And God, we ask that you would stir and move and work and help us to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.